Good morning, friends, and welcome now to our 22nd session in our study of the book of Revelation. In our last session, we were reminded by John that he sees himself as a prophet in the image of the great mystic prophets of old, prophets like Daniel and Ezekiel and, and Zechariah, for instance. And these were prophets who used a strange and fascinating images as they sketched out what they believed God had in store for the people of Israel and the, the whole world, in fact. And now as we enter into the 11th chapter of Revelation, we are going to be seeing how John uses some of those uh, images that, that Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah provided to further his message, calling his listeners to hold fast to their faith, no matter the trials that may come. In the first three verses of the 11th chapter, we read, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample over the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days wearing sackcloth. So this image of a person measuring the temple is taken from Ezekiel and, and Zechariah. And the image for Ezekiel was apparently about giving the divine architect the measurements needed to restore the temple when they returned from exile, as well as reminding the people of the, the glory of the Lord. But for Zechariah, it had to do with measuring the city of Jerusalem in order for God to set a, a line of divine defense around it. And uh, the commentators on the book of, of Revelation seem to believe that the, the measuring that John has been called to do is about establishing which parts of the temple will be divinely protected by God and which parts will be left open to be trampled by others. And I think it's important for us to note before we go on that John is being called to measure the temple some 30 years or so after it had already been destroyed by the Romans. So whatever this is about, it's not about actually defending the physical temple there are various theories about what it means to have measured the inner courts, but leaving the outer courts unmeasured. Some suggest that this has to do with God providing some kind of uh, divine protection to the Christians who are of a Hebrew heritage while leaving the Gentile Christians on their own to suffer whatever is to come. But uh, this seems highly unlikely since many of the believers that John was ministering to are very likely uh, Gentiles themselves, and he would not be likely to devalue them or, or their faith. The theory that seems the most solid to me suggests that measuring the inner temple is symbolic of God protecting the spiritual life of the believers even if the outer portions or the, the physical life of the believers may have to suffer throughout the, the times of persecution and trials to come. Now, we note the mention of 42 months and its equivalent in days, which is uh, the uh, 1,260 days. And this is another way of saying three and a half years, which is one half of seven years. And this is the amount of time that the prophet Daniel had proclaimed as the time of trials that lay ahead, although Daniel calls it a time, two times, and a half time, which would be interpreted here as a year plus two years, which would be three years, plus a half a year, which would be, uh, of course, three and a half years. And all of this then is leading into this vision of these two prophetic witnesses who were long believed to be 
coming back before the end times. And, and let's read on now to get uh, a little bit of their story. Uh, and we'll pick up in verse four where it describes them as uh, olive trees and lampstands. It says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Anyone who wants to harm them must be killed in this manner. They have authority to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Now here John is using an image from Zechariah once again, and Zechariah's image was of this uh, candle stand, a, a candelabra with seven candles on it. And beside the candelabra, were two olive trees, one on the right and one on the left. And I think that we're to picture them kind of as spreading their branches in a manner that allowed the oil from them to drip through a, a golden tube into or onto the candelabra and maintain a constant source of fuel for the, uh, the candle lights, the fires. And for Zechariah, this was an image of two champions of the people, Zerubbabel, the anointed king, and Joshua, the anointed priest, who would uh, nurture basically one another uh, and the faithful and keep the nation and the faith ablaze. But the idea of the two witnesses may have also fit into the apocalyptic expectations that before the end of the era, the two great prophets would return to earth. And many thought that these would be Moses and Elijah, as we see on the, uh, in the uh, uh, story of the Transfiguration, both of whom died in obscure circumstances and were often expected to return. Or, you know, it might be Elijah and a, another prophet. But uh, once again, John has kind of taken this prophetic image and shaped it in such a way that it would work in and for his own vision. This idea of fire issuing from their mouths in order to defend themselves during their prophetic ministries is uh, an interesting one. The more literally minded of the interpreters, they often take this to be uh, an image of some kind of a physical flamethrower, as though these were... Uh, half fire breathing dragons and half prophets. But as we consider this um, symbolically, we note that this may well be referring to the, the manner in which their words and their, their logic, their arguments would reduce the arguments of their opponents to ashes and thus metaphorically destroy their opponents. The divine powers that they're given, they're reminiscent of the powers that Elijah and Moses were said to have had during their ministries. Elijah causing drought and, and Moses channeling the plagues in Egypt. So not only are we to see these as their manner of proving and defending themselves, but these powers also confirm their identity for us. But uh, let's not be too quick in assuming that John is speaking of two uh, human people here, let alone two ancient prophetic uh, figures who are, are uh, resurrected now and sent back to earth after thousands of years of, of having been dead. Many theologians and commentators offer ideas of what these two witnesses may stand for. Some say it's uh, the law and the prophets in kind of a general sense. And some suggest that they stand for um, uh, the church, the witness of the church and the witness of the scriptures. And there are uh, just many other interpretations. It seems to me that the two stand for the witness of, of Christ in and through his church in some form, whether you want to dissect this as to be the witness of Christ and the witness of the church or, or the spirit through the church or, or whatever, I, I, I don't know exactly. 
And why the two witnesses? Well, in biblical times, the word of one witness could not legally sway the court, but the word of two witnesses was considered a valid witness. So uh, back now to our reading from chapter 11, and we're going to start reading now from verse 7. We read, When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, members of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb, and the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to the inhabitants of the earth. So the witnesses were given three and a half years to share their word of witness, but after that time is up, they are attacked by a beast that comes up from the bottomless pit. And we've already heard of the bottomless pit in our reading, and when we did, it was locusts that rose from it, and the locust had the power to sting people with a sting like scorpions, but we've not yet been introduced to a beast from the pit. So maybe John is foreshadowing what is yet to come in his vision. But the outcome is that the beast, as perhaps an image of, of Rome or sin or whatever that might represent, that beast conquers and kills the witnesses, perhaps we're thinking the church, leaving it lying for dead in the streets. And it's an interesting image. The idea is that the beast that kills the witnesses leaves their corpses in the streets and thus doesn't allow them the common decency of a burial. And the people are celebrating the death of those two witnesses who must have made them feel somewhat ashamed of their ways and, and frustrated their hopes to live a life that was unconstrained by decency or, or righteousness. So they're partying in the streets now over their dead bodies. And by the way, this is the city that was prophetically called Sodom in Egypt, but the story is actually set in the city where Jesus was crucified which is the city of Jerusalem, right? So that's where this is taking place, at least in the, the narrative of the story. And because I think of the witnesses as the church in some form, I imagine this as perhaps being people who had been dissuaded from attending church or being ashamed of the church or seeing faith as useless and therefore abandoning the church. And, and I don't see it necessarily as the church as a, a building or an institution so much as, as a body of supportive uh, fellow believers in Christ. And in my mind, that's what the people are celebrating, the failure of that system, of that supportive uh, fellowship. But as the story continues, we hear of a resurrection. We read now in verse 11, but after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and those who saw them were terrified. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies watched them. At that moment there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So the witnesses are resurrected now through the power of God in a scene that's very reminiscent of, well, several stories in the Bible, the creation of the, the first humans in Genesis, and when the uh, dry bones were given new life, and the resurrection of Jesus in the Gospels, uh, the spirit of life, the breath of life, it enters again into the lifeless 
corpses of the witness and, and they rise again. And just seeing this terrified the people who had just been partying over them. And again, I, I take the witnesses to be the church in some form. So in my imagination, what's happened is that the church as a body had become ineffectual and lifeless. Perhaps human reason and intellect had struck a, a savage blow against it. And the, the numbers of participants and adherents had, had plummeted, making the organization all but dead. But after a short period of time, God breathes new life into the church and it rises with a, a new power that even those who had been, well, its greatest opponents, they can't deny, they can't evade it. Now, some might think that since I see the witnesses as the church, I would take this next bit of the vision, the part of them rising into heaven as an image of the rapture where the faithful are said to be lifted out of the times of tribulation to come. But for me, that just wouldn't make sense of the, uh, the surrounding kind of imagery that we have in this vision. In this, it's apparent that it is the faithful who maintain their testimony throughout the tribulations that will nurture these new believers and fill that banquet hall for the victory celebration that's yet to come. So for me, verse 12 is not so much about a physical lifting of the church out of the physical plane, but uh, perhaps an encouragement of the church by showing God calling them spiritually to God's kingdom at that time, kind of a foreshadowing of things to come for them. It's that promise of being physically present when the time is right. And that image of the two witnesses rising alive again to heaven, it recalls a couple of things, really. First off, it's right in line with the image of Moses and Elijah as the returned prophetic witnesses, because each is thought, at least by some, to have been taken into heaven alive. And some see this as the condition that allows them the ability to come back into the earthly realm of the living once again. But this also reminds us of uh, Jesus' ascension. And thus, it would remind the faithful followers that just as Jesus had risen and ascended to the Father, so they would also follow him in that ascension. Now, when they lift off for heaven, there's uh, something like an equal and opposite reaction. The earthquake described here is somewhat local, but nonetheless terrifying. It destroys a tenth of the city and 7,000 people, which may seem like a relative few in apocalyptic terms, but think of that in terms of a, a local or even a national disaster. Think of 9-11, where about 3,000 people died, and, and we just were struck by it so significantly. But perhaps the more significant thing here is what happens with the rest, with the survivors, as it were. They were terrified, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. And this hasn't been a part of the reaction to any of the other trials that have fallen on the people of the earth. In every other case, it seems like it's a matter of, well, in spite of which, the people hardened their hearts and refused to change their ways. So uh, this seems like kind of a, uh, a precursor to something new that's on the horizon. It's just a taste of the possible repentance that may happen in reaction to the events of John's vision. And now I think we'll finish today with just a, a brief reading of the 14th verse, which simply says, the second woe has passed. The third woe is coming very soon. So all of this has been a description of the, the second of the three woes. And there is one more woe to come. But let's leave that final woe to another day. And for today, let's close our study with a word of prayer. Lord God, 
we give you thanks for your son, the still living word that reveals you to us in order that we, as your body of witnesses on earth, might reveal you to others. There have been many times in the past when the church seemed to be on the ropes, perhaps taking its last gulp of air, but through your spirit, it was revived. We pray that you will continue to nourish us that we might witness of you with faithful hearts and that even should times seem very bleak indeed, that we will wait upon you to bring us the resurrection life, not for our own sakes alone, but for all of your beloved children throughout your creation. Amen. Friends, once again, I do want to thank you for spending this time with me in our study. I pray that it's benefiting you in some way, touching your spirit, giving you courage and inspiration. And I pray that your week and your lives are going very well indeed. God bless you in all that you do. Amen.